All right. So with all that, now you're going to go off and do the assignment on contrasting these two anesthesia cases. And we'll email you or we'll put up the description on CritViz so you have the write-ups right there as you do the assignment. Okay? That's, they're not up there yet, but they'll be up there. So again, we're back to what's our account of the fundamental, comprehensive, technical foundations for this adaptive universe? Next one. Oh, let's start with a map. So this is a 12th century, 13th century map of the known world. So here's the known world. They drew it as a circle, which was nice of them to do for me to take advantage of a few centuries later. And outside the known world, here be dragons in Latin. Here be dragons. All right, so that's our metaphor that we're going to utilize. Next one. So the known world is the confidence envelope or your base adaptive capacity. Hmm. So there's things you know how to do. Hmm. There's things you've built into the plans, you've built into the procedures, you've built into the skills that you invest in uh, people through training. There are automation that has embodied procedures and rules in various forms and different kinds of technology for doing that. All of those are related to your confidence envelope. But whatever you invest in, whatever great technique or mathematical analysis or data set you utilize, it is subject to finite resources, therefore it has a boundary, has a range of adaptive behavior, has a range of variations, conditions, situations, and changes that it can deal with. And there's a boundary. We're going to call those borderlands for a reason. So it's bounded. Right? And the boundary isn't always clear, and it moves around, so we're going to call it the borderlands. Next one. Right? So borderlands, competence envelope, plans, procedures, automation, and contingencies. The compliance mentality thinks, I have plans and automation and contingencies that work. And the system will work great as long as the, those who implement the system, who carry out the plans, who work with the automation, behave to plan. If you work to plan, everything will be great, right? So it's work to plan, work to roll in the plan, work to the rules of the, within the plan. Work to rule, work to roll, work to plan. However the plan is embodied, right? And everything will be great. So if something goes wrong, it's because you didn't work to rule. You didn't work to roll, you didn't work to plan. When they look after the fact, they can always find something you did that was at variance with rules, roles, and plans. So then they come back and go, gee, it's erratic people. The plan would have worked great if, you, if erratic people hadn't messed it up. That fundamentally is the compliance culture. Right? It says, I can make this confidence envelope incorporate all of the variation, right, disturbances, and patterns in the world. And all we have to say is change is continuous. Resources are finite. right? And in an adaptive network, success is going to be exploited by other units in the network for their advantage. The biggest thing that drives adaptation and limits your confidence envelope is success. That's the paradox. The more successful you are, the more this matters, right? Because the more you're going to introduce change, which is going to create the possibility for new dragons to show up in the borderlands. So what we end up with is two kinds of capabilities. Our base or competence envelope, far from saturation, far from when we're running out of our adaptive range, right? Our capacity for maneuver, we're risking saturation. And we have another property of what happens when we're near the boundary, that's graceful extensibility. Graceful extensibility, can I extend performance uh, as I approach boundaries? What boundary? I don't know where the boundary is for sure. If I think I know where it is, it probably isn't there. And even if I do know exactly where it is, it won't stay there because it's dynamic and other units will adapt to take advantage of my success. So I'm not sure of where it is, but what I can, be, what I can know is my risk of saturation. I can know if I'm running out of capacity to maneuver into the future. Why? Because I've used it all up. If I have no more, or I've almost used it all up, so if there's new upcoming events and demands and disturbances to deal with, I don't have any more resource to deploy in order to handle those demands. So risk of saturation matters. So I have two things, graceful extensibility, 
confidence envelope. Where does this come from? The coinage comes very simply from two terms. Graceful degradation, right? So a brittle thing versus gracefully degrading. Brittle means it rapid fall off at the boundary. Gracefully degrading means I slowly fall off, right? Most, most machines graceful, uh, um, are brittle. They fail rapidly at the boundaries. <coughs> Human systems tend to fail gracefully at the boundaries. Biological systems tend to fail, uh, fail gracefully. But as we've talked about with flash boys and the rise of high frequency trading and fluorescence, seizing opportunities and a potential advantage, um, it's not just about ne reducing negatives. It's not just about behaving less poorly at the boundaries, right, when things go bad or in a crisis. So there's another term, classic term in software engineering called software extensibility. So when you design a software system, over its life cycle, you can guarantee it will be reused in new ways, interacting with other new kinds of software modules for new kinds of users and stakeholders using it in new contexts. So over its life cycle, it will encounter these kinds of changes. And so you have to design the software now for the ability to extend its performance over its life cycle. The mechanisms for it to continue to adapt to new uses, new stakeholders, new contexts. Right? This is all in the four census paper. So what we end up with is confidence, graceful extensibility, borderlands, range of adaptive behavior, dragons. What are the dragons? They are the shape of surprise that you were pointing out. Right? I don't know the details, but I can say something about them. Examples, cascades. In a more interconnected world, one trigger event can cascade, creating more and more difficulties, demands, and variation. We ran through a couple examples of that just quickly as we talked through examples of adaptive cycles in the cases just introducing the class. Friction and putting plans into time. Everybody lays out a plan. What's the advantage of a plan? It exists out of time. What's the disadvantage of a plan? It exists out of time. For a plan to be enacted, you have to put it back in time. Right? So the problem is friction, back to our friend Clausewitz, uh, is the difficulties that happen when plans go into action in the variability and changes of real worlds. Right? What was an example, Eric? Eric used to fly airplanes off aircraft carriers. He is a professor from Norway uh, who is actually uh, here to discuss aspects of organizations and how leadership in organizations can create more resilient behavior and performances from that organization. And you gave me an example on your F-14 days. Gonna, I'm gonna give you a different one. Oh, a different one. I'll tell you when I was the first time I met the Dragon. <laughs> the F-14 was a very nice airplane. You probably have you all seen the movie Top Gun? <laughs> okay, anyway, the F-14 was a very complex airplane. And what he's talking about, these envelopes, we, no, sorry. we had um, lots of envelopes that we had to understand because, you know, we were flying in combat against other airplanes. We had to know both our envelopes and their envelopes. The problem with envelopes are it's kind of hard to remember all of them when you're in the middle of a fight. So once while fighting an F-4, an F-4 is not as good as an F-14, much older, and to beat an F-4, what you want to do is press him in to that area of the envelope where he can't fly anymore. The problem is when we're in that end of the envelope, we're close to not flying anymore either. And the problem is you don't know when you're going to go from flying to not flying. So you can imagine being up on upside down, looking backwards like this, and suddenly nothing happens. And you're falling. And you've lost control. You've met the dragon. And you go from fighting to trying to come back and survive. And that's a good example. That's a great example of reprioritization, <laughs> recognizing it's not about the uh, combat. It's about the uh, saving the plane and yourself. Uh, the other example he reminded us of was great. He says a, a, a set of F-14s arrived. They're all identical off the factory floor, right? And within a few months, none of them were identical. The way they were used, maintained, turns out, even though it's a physical system off a classic assembly line process, turns out they're never the same once they go into use and maintenance. They start having their own idiosyncratic behaviors and get personalized in a way and that is not strange psychological behavior. That is the exertion of the inherent variability of the adaptive universe. Right? We tend to pretend it's less variable than it really is. Um, all right, next one. Oh, changing tempos. That's right. That's another good one. 
So what are we asking with graceful extensibility? Back to your two anesthesia examples, right? What produces graceful extensibility? What reduces the risk of the descriptive form of brittleness, rapid collapse when you're near the boundaries? But remember, right, we can't always be sure where the boundary is. We'll talk more about why that happens. Um, and that we can start to think about where it is as we understand the risk of saturation, right? Because right, we can get signs of the risk of saturation growing before we right, to discover where boundaries are and before we get too close. Right? His situation was an interesting one because you're, you actually get an advantage by operating close to the boundary. <laughs> interesting. Um, and then the question is, what kinds of dragons are lurking near at and beyond the boundary? And one of the key things here is anticipating crunches or bottlenecks ahead. And how do you generate and sustain a readiness to respond? All of this stuff should be helping you characterize those two anesthesia cases. What makes them examples of resilient performance? All right, why is the attending anesthesiologist in a different situation with respect to sustaining those sources of resilience versus the safety manager who started the crisis management training program? Why does the training program get cut? Or why might it get cut in the future? Next one. Um, we're going to skip these because we don't have time to go through this now because we're going to stop pretty soon. Keep going. Uh, readiness to respond. So this is an important concept for your glossary, readiness to respond. And that's about how you deploy, mobilize, or generate these capabilities. In the anesthesiologist case, think about how he's got a deployable. He's mo shifting from a mobilized to deploy. Right? What is the safety manager doing? in terms of using crisis management, right, and going from maybe from here to here, right? Readiness to respond highlights that it isn't that you always have to do it, right? The probability of the first anesthesia story isn't that most of the time there was a crisis they had to respond to. The issue was they anticipated the possibility of the bottleneck and prepared in advance so they weren't trapped in the crunch. Next one. Uh, keep going. All right. Um, now I want you to understand the difference between a why a compliance perspective can so quickly get lost and miss the need for graceful extensibility near the boundaries. They, they can miss the way dragons of surprise show up. So perspective one says, I've got a great confidence envelope. It's been getting better, right? It's faster, better, and cheaper. I've got a great quality record. I've got less safety incidents on my safety reporting system. Everything looks better. So their idea is work to roll, work to rule. Over here, perspective two, closer to the world, the point is action in the world, what do they do? They're handling dragons all the time. They are handling dragons all the time. From their point of view, surprise occurs regularly. So I walk in and talk to an emergency room doc. And this is Shauna. And I go, I go OK. Uh, tell me how many shifts you have to work before you have an event that challenges your expertise as a great emergency room doc. And Shauna just laughs and says, last night. <laughs> right? It's the fifth worst uh, ER, fifth busiest ER in the country. So if you were to acquire one, maybe not every shift or almost every shift. Right? And that illustrates this idea of the potential for surprise. And because surprise happens so regularly in that environment, what do they do? They develop the skills and capabilities that are often invisible to us. They're not the standard things that you would track if you were watching an ER. But these are the things that give them that ability to continue to adapt. How they work, how they work with each other, and sometimes how they reconfigure the whole emergency department depending upon the load they have to handle. And by the way, occasionally fail, where you under-treat and under-respond to some patients uh, waiting or starting to be uh, handled by the ER, and then they have a physiological crisis and maybe uh, bad consequences because they were under-monitored and under-responsive uh, under treatment because the ED is so busy with so many other uh, commitments and demands relative to its staff. So because they're handling surprise regularly, the distant views from uh, upper echelons miss the dragons that regularly show up, how they're tamed. Because others provide the graceful extensibility regularly. And this is a story we see over and over again. 
that when we don't design in graceful extensibility, it turns out we have to get it. Where do we get it from? Well, some people provide it because people can be the source of graceful extensibility. Mm -hmm. So if you care and you're expert, you can provide that resource. And that's what we see over and over again. Now that's also called the fluency law. Another thing for your glossary. You didn't know you were gonna get so much for your glossary right off the bat, right? The fluency law, well-adapted activity, right? Hides the difficulties handled and the dilemmas resolved. We'll send you the exact wording of the fluency law. So you can deal with that. But the fluency law comes up here. So we're throwing a lot of stuff at you. You're going to have to slowly incorporate into your mindset here. Next one. Oh, keep going. We've seen it. Faster, better, cheaper keeps coming after you. Keep going. We, we're going to keep going. Oh, we'll go back one. Uh, no, that went the wrong way. There we go. Uh, that's right. So here's the other case. If there's a change in the dragons that show up and they're handled poorly, the up close perspective says I need to adjust what kinds of dragons I need to recognize and how I tame them. And what does the distant view says? Hey, you didn't comply with the rules and the roles, therefore we need more rigidity. We need to put more pressure on you to just do uh, the work as, as specified by the role description, by the procedures, how you work with the automation, whatever, which undermines your adaptive capacities reduces the adaptive capacity of the system, that section of the network. Right? Meanwhile, these guys are trying to adjust their adaptive capacity. They're trying to adapt how they adapt because new kinds of dragons are showing up. That's all going to be in the history of the regulators, right? the rise of high frequency trading. You're going to see right, how this plays out. New dragons show up. Uh, right? And if a change in dragons is handled well, the distant perspective says, see, the plan was great. They don't even notice there was a change in dragons. And the up-close people say, of course that's what I do. That's, I'm a good practitioner, so I handle, I tame dragons. So there were new dragons, and I tamed them. That's my job. That's my identity. That's why I'm good. Next one. Keep going. We'll get to these later. Uh, what we're going to introduce is the idea that both the pursuit of optimality under faster, better, cheaper pressure and the ability to sustain graceful extent, to invest in and sustain graceful ability are simultaneous properties of a good organization or unit. Right? You have to have both. And we'll run through some existence cases that show in the biological world, you need both. To be effective, I need this, and I need this. Why do I need this? Because surprise will happen. Why? Because there's finite resources, which means there's a limit to my range of adaptive capacity, regardless of how I invest in building the competence envelope. Right? On the other hand, if I just do this, what's going to happen? Think about the safety manager in the anesthesia crisis training case. Over time, is it going to look like it was a, a source of resilience or an inefficiency to be pruned from the system under faster, better, cheaper pressure? Notice I'm helping you analyze these two cases and your ability to lay out what they represent as general, even specific cases that represent general patterns about net adaptive value, right, is important. All right, this is, uh, so let's summarize the dragons for you. We're almost done for the day. All right, a distant perspective, an upper echelon looks out and says, I have a plan. Right? However, it's embodied in procedures, policies, and automation. And when I look at the world, it's always springtime. There is green on the trees. The trees look wonderful. It's a pastoral setting. If the plan, everybody works to plan, and everything is going to be wonderful. Next one. Press it again. Meanwhile, over their units closer to the sharp end, what are they doing? They're taming dragons. They know this is at risk. Right? They're busy taming the dragons. Well, this guy's off going, isn't my plan beautiful? Missing all the activities that go on over here. Next one. What's the guy taming the dragons looking over his shoulder? Hey, I could use some help over here. What are you guys doing? Uh, that plan isn't working so well. There's other stuff we have to deal with. Tip it again. Oh, yeah, there he's going. See, there's a struggle. Come on, guys, help me out here. Next one. All right, so that's our antagonist, compliance culture. If you only emphasize the competence envelope, if you only pursue optimality, even if you add in robustness criterion for well-defined disturbances, right, what's going to happen? 
you're going to undermine the sources that create graceful extensibility, and you're going to end up with a system that's more brittle at the edges. The problem is you don't know where the edges are. Right? There's no way to definitively know. Right? There's some inherent uncertainty. It's dynamic. You will think you understand where they are. We're pretty sure it will be misplaced. Even if you were accurate, it's going to change. Why does it change? Because when you're successful, other units in the network will adapt. Right? Hijacking your success to help them get advantage for their goals. All of these things are going to be seen in the stories of high frequency trading, the recognition of front running by Brad. So at one point, our unit of adaptive behavior is Brad. At another, our unit of adaptive behavior is IEX. At another, our unit of adaptive behavior is regulators. Another point, it might be dark pools. Another point, it might be the high frequency traders, even though they exist in different organizations. At some point, you'll see a company go, wait a minute, we have a dark pool as part of our company, but our dark pool can't compete with the dark pools in the other companies, so we better not try to beat everybody at their dark pool. We'll do a different way to gain advantage. What are we seeing? We're seeing different units at different levels adapting to change. Right? Right? And the change is the seeking of advantage. And what's exciting about the rise of high frequency trading, it's a fluorescence, it's rapid, it affects many units at many levels, it changes what's success, it changes the vulnerabilities, it changes the failures, it changes who gains and who loses, right? which then creates a reconfiguration to resist right? and say re-level and create a neutral playing field, a story that continued long past the ending of the book. IEX just became an official stock exchange uh, a month ago. So it was trading, but it wasn't an official stock exchange till a month ago. So there was a much more ups and downs in the story after the book ends, which we may or may not get into. We have to have two kinds of capabilities, right? Pursuing optimality and creating graceful extensibility to overcome inevitable brittleness in the face of change and surprise have to have both, net adaptive value. Right? Most of the organizations in a compliance culture emphasizing one, undermining the other. Right? If, we, if we do a brute force investment in graceful extensibility, it's not sustainable. Why? Because over time, it will be, look too inefficient, and the resources will get cut. Right? Then we'll over tilt the other way. Right? In effect, it takes two numbers. If you want to boil it down to numbers, it takes two numbers to characterize the performance of a system. Its ability to become more optimal with respect to frequently incur, uh, occurring events, uh, patterns, and variations, and one that is rapid, able to rapidly respond effectively in the face of novel and different uh, surprises and opportunities. I need both capabilities. Guess what's a great example of this? Our brains. And we can run through from the neurocomputational point of view how our brains do both. Right? And it's really neat. And you can even mathematically model it, too, if you love to do mathematical models. Right? So it's really cool stuff. And that's where we're going to go, understanding this. Now, those two numbers are hard to deal with. Why? Because of the trade-off I just described. Right? They trade off. That's the robust from uh, yet fragile point in Doyle and Alderson's paper. As the, with complexity. Pursuing optimality, even with robustness, will end up creating or moving around fragilities in ways that will generate the possibility of a sudden collapse. It will look inexplicable because all of the signs where we were getting better on all of the short-term measures. Right? How do we sustain an investment? How do we identify what's a, a useful investment and sustain that investment in things like anticipation? And so we're going to work through the kinds of things you need to invest in and the problems in sustaining that investment as you balance net adaptive value between these two cri both critical forms of performance. That's the stories we're going to keep telling when we tilt too far one way or the other and these things get out of balance. And the way you're going to do that is we have two more assignments for you. So one is you're going to start the process of charting adaptive cycles. And I didn't get to this yet. So we'll do start with this on Friday. So the assignment is out there. We might move the dates that are currently in there. But you're going to start charting the rise of high frequency trading. And I need to give you some more guidance and help to do that. But you can start looking at the book and go, OK, what was going on? What were my units? Right? Who's gaining advantage? What's the consequences of those? And we'll give you some more guidance on how to chart it initially, because it's a struggle to do this. 
uh, and it's part of what the whole seven weeks is about. So you're going to start with the rise of high frequency trading to start laying this out. And we'll introduce that on Friday first thing. The second one I want you to get going on is I want you to start identifying all of the surprises that occurred in Flash Boys. Find surprises, right? They could be fast, they could be slow, they could be quick but hard to see, they could be easy to see but hard to understand what it really means, but you can see that there's a change, but understanding how it surprises, surprises and change everything might be hard until the consequences play out. Uh, I want you to identify surprises. Right? So the idea in this is you're going to identify surprises, you're going to update, you're going to uh, upload it, the surprises you find. You're going to see the surprises and characterization that others find, right? Because you'll get to see four others. You rate them as to what's most valuable to you. And then in class, we're going to discuss the set of surprises that you found in groups. And we're going to put it all together over the course of uh, the rest of this week and next week. So by the end of next week, we're going to have a we want a list of all of the kinds of surprises that occur in the book Flash Boys, which means you have to finish the book. Sorry. <laughs> when I assigned six chapters, you didn't think I was really gonna, not going to stop there, right? Hopefully, you mostly have all read it all. You couldn't put it down, I hope. Um, it is going to be a movie. Uh, so we want to chart all the surprises by the end of next week. All right? So I want to attract your attention that surprise is a normal part of the adaptive universe, and how to be prepared to handle surprise is critical. That's why we're going to look in detail at those two anesthesia cases. So uh, a lot of stuff for you to get going. Uh, so we're jump starting, and then we'll and then we'll try to even it out a little bit in terms of the pace over the next six weeks. All right, we're good.